Hi, this is John Ainsley from Doulos. This video is Easier UVM Tests. Like other videos in this series, this video is a tutorial primarily in which I'm going to describe how to use tests in UVM. During this video, I'll be taking advantage of the Easier UVM coding guidelines and the Easier UVM code generator from Doulos. You can find out more about Easier UVM from the URL shown here. Most of the code examples that you see in this tutorial were generated from the Easier UVM code generator. The convention that's used on these slides is that in the generated examples, automatically generated boilerplate code is shown in a black font, whereas user-defined code fragments that were inserted into that boilerplate code are shown in a blue font. So here goes, let's take a look at tests in UVM. So by now you should be familiar with the basic idea of a UVM verification environment. The verification environment consists of agents. Those agents are nested inside UVM ENVs. And then finally, at the top level, the top level UVM ENV is instantiated from a UVM test. The ENV then executes, and that means having UVM sequences executing on sequences that generate transactions. And a good idea in UVM is to make the top level UVM ENV self-contained. That is, the top level ENV should just run by itself out of the box without any tweaking and be able to generate constrained random stimulus to exercise the design under test. Then comes the UVM test itself, which is normally just a fairly thin wrapper around the ENV. In fact, in the extreme case, the test could effectively be empty and contain nothing but the ENV itself, in which case the only distinction between two different tests is that two different tests might be started with different random seeds to give slightly different test stimulus. So tests would be the place to write any directed testing code that you wanted to include. In other words, although directed testing doesn't really fit with a constrained random testing methodology, you certainly can add directed tests. And if you wanted directed tests, the place to define those tests would be in your UVM tests. Typically, however, UVM tests are restricted to doing two things, factory overrides and making settings in the configuration database. I'll be showing examples of factory overrides in configuration database settings in a minute. Let's take a look at some code. Here's a very, very simple test class. As you can see, a test class extends the base class UVM test. A test is a UVM component, so it's registered for factory automation with the UVM component utils macro. The test then has a variable that contains a reference to the env, and it has standard constructors and a build phase method in which we're going to instantiate that env and make any other settings that we need to make. So now let's take a look at the build phase method for that test. And this build phase method illustrates the two things that we would typically do in tests, that is set variables in the configuration database and make factory overrides. So this particular test is setting the value of a variable, just for the sake of illustration, within a configuration object, where that configuration object is part of a hierarchy of configuration objects that have all been set into the configuration database by the top-level module. We'll look at the top-level module code in a few minutes. So this build phase method is getting our top-level configuration object out of the configuration database. Then within that top level configuration object, there's a sub configuration object for one of our agents, the clock and data agent. And in the test, we're setting the value or assigning a value to the count variable within that configuration object. So in other words, the methodology we're taking is to write a tree of nested configuration objects into the configuration database from the top level module. And then within the test, we can retrieve that tree of configuration objects and make 
any adjustments that we need to make that are specific to this given test. Because if we don't make adjustments in the given test, then the configuration object will just run with its default settings, which may be randomized settings. So it will do something meaningful by default, and the test is in effect just tweaking the contents of the configuration database. Then comes a factory override, more specifically a type override. So the way to read this code is to say that what we're doing is replacing all instances of the class clock and data default sequence with a new class my clock and data sequence. This code is generated from the easier UVM code generator that creates a sequence for you by default for each agent. So the clock and data default sequence is the automatically generated default sequence for a particular agent on our design under test. And then we're setting a factory override to replace that default sequence with a user defined sequence, my clock and data sequence. Then after doing the settings in the configuration database and after making any factory overrides, we then call the create method in order to instantiate the environment. And that's it. That's the complete test. Let's say a little bit more about factory overrides. So what we're doing here is replacing a default sequence with a user-defined sequence. And the alternate type that we provide in our factory override has to extend the base type that we first mentioned in the factory override. So here we're providing a class my clock and data sequence that extends clock and data default sequence. And if we go back to the factory override, we're doing a type override on clock and data default sequence to replace it with my clock and data sequence. The replacement object always has to extend the object that it's replacing whenever you do a factory override, just as you can see here. So here's a particular example using a sequence. So if, for example, you wanted to add a directed test as part of a particular UVM test, you might do that by replacing an existing sequence with a user-defined sequence to do something very specific. So let's just describe factory overrides a little bit more carefully. The first kind of factory override that I've described is a type override where we're saying replace all instances of one type with another type. And the type in question could be components, sequences and transactions. Whenever you create a component, a sequence or a transaction object, you should always do it using the so-called factory method, as I've described in previous video tutorials. So you use this kind of set type override whenever you want to replace all instances of any given component, sequence or transaction with an alternative user-defined type. There's another kind of type override that you'll meet, and that is the inst override. A set inst override also replaces occurrences of one type with an extended type, but inst override is specific to a particular component instance. So as you can see, it's got a couple of extra arguments. The first argument is the extended type that we're replacing the original type with. Then comes a path, which is a hierarchical path of a component. And this time it's got to be a component, not a sequence or a transaction, because only components have hierarchical path names. And this path is given relative to the component that's passed as the third argument to set inst override. And that third argument can technically be any reference to any UVM component, but typically it's going to be either this or null. So if you set the third argument to this, it means the second argument is going to be a relative hierarchical path name relative to the caller. If you set the third argument to null, then the hierarchical path would become an absolute hierarchical path name, starting at the very top of the UVM component hierarchy. So set type override and set inst override between them will cover at least 90% of the cases where you want to do factory overrides. But a feature of this kind of factory override is that the types are specified using system Verilog type names. Original type and extended type are system Verilog types. And that means the types have to be known at compile time. 
Sometimes, however, you want to do factory overrides where the types are not known at compile time. Maybe you want to add in some new classes, compile them in addition to the original classes, and then use them to replace objects of the original classes. To do that, you need to delve a little bit deeper into the UVM sequence and actually go off and find the UVM factory object. The UVM factory is an object of type UVM factory. And in recent versions of UVM, if you want to get hold of the UVM factory, you have to do it by calling the static get method of the UVM factory class. So UVM factory get returns you a reference to the one and only UVM factory. And the UVM factory is the object that actually does all the hard work of creating transactions and sequences and components in UVM. Having got a reference to the factory, we can then call other methods of the factory. In particular, with this technique, you can do type overrides not based on the original types as specified in system Verilog syntax, but based on the names of the types expressed as strings. So here we're doing a set type override by name, where we're saying replace all instances of original type with extended type, where original type and extended type are actually strings. And because they're strings, the values of these strings needn't be known until runtime. In fact, we don't have to pass literal strings in as the arguments of set override by name. We could pass in variables, and the values of those variables can be changed dynamically during simulation. So now, for example, you could read in the names of the types that you wanted to override from a text file. Or indeed, you could pass in the types to be overridden on the system Verilog command line, and we'll see how to do that a little bit later. Another reason why you might want to get a handle to the factory itself and call its methods is for factory debug. So there's a very useful method print of the UVM factory class that prints out all of the current factory overrides. So this code again was automatically generated by the easier UVM code generator. We've got an end of elaboration phase method which gets a handle to the factory and then prints out all of the factory overrides that were current at the end of elaboration. So we've looked at defining some very simple tests. Now let's look at how we run a test. So tests are run very simply by calling the run test function from a system Verilog module. So this is how we invoke and instantiate the entire class-based UVM verification environment from the module-based system Verilog world. Normally, you would have a top-level System Verilog module that contained a System Verilog process, such as an initial block, that called run test. And it's this call to run test which instantiates the entire UVM component hierarchy and then sets the UVM phase mechanism in action. In other words, everything that's going to happen in UVM happens below this call to run test. Typically, what you do before calling run test is to set at least some values into the configuration database. At a very minimum, we'll need to set virtual interfaces into the configuration database so that our test stimulus and our monitors can find the actual interfaces connected to the design under test. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're setting a virtual interface within the configuration of our clock and data agent to refer to the actual interface connected to the clock and data interface on the dot, th.clockanddataif0. So let's put that together. In order to write and then execute a test in UVM, first of all, you need to create your own test class by extending the test base class, UVM test. Then you call the run test method from a process in a system Verilog module. And then you actually have to tie the two things together by effectively telling UVM the name of your test for this particular simulation run. And the usual and best way to do that is using a flag on the System Verilog command line. And in fact, UVM provides a standard flag for that purpose, plus UVM test name equals. And every System Verilog simulator will support this standard UVM flag. So the call to run test will look on the System Verilog command line, see that we've selected top test as our UVM test name, 
and therefore instantiate an object of this class top test as the top level component in our UVM component hierarchy. So here we're seeing a standard flag that goes on the system variable command line, and that flag is going to be processed by the UVM command line processor. The UVM command line processor provides a number of built-in flags that you can read directly from the UVM command line. I'll describe some of those in a minute. The command line processor also gives you a very general way of reading any arguments from the system Verilog command line. Here's a few of the most useful flags. So you can pick up the test name from the command line. You can do factory overrides from the command line as an alternative to calling set type override within your system Verilog code. So here from the system Verilog command line, we're adding the flag plus UVM set type override and then naming the old and the new types. And that allows you to do factory overrides on a test by test basis without having to recompile any system Verilog code, which is a really nice feature. Then there's a range of other flags supported by the command line processor. Plus UVM config DB trace turns on configuration database tracing. So we'll get useful diagnostic messages printed out whenever we write settings into the configuration database. UVM objection trace traces whenever we raise and drop objections. And that's a good segue into the next topic of this tutorial, which is how we bring a UVM simulation to an end. And that's done using the UVM objection mechanism. Let's take a look at that. Beginners often find objections confusing, but there's no reason why they should be, because objections are fundamentally a very, very simple and well-defined mechanism. Objections control when the test and the UVM simulation comes to an end. And the rules are very straightforward. Rule number one, any UVM component or any UVM sequence can raise or drop objections whenever it likes. Rule number two, each runtime phase ends when the number of objections raised is zero. So loosely speaking, we could say that objections control when a test comes to an end. More technically, objections actually control when each runtime phase comes to an end. So if you have multiple runtime phases in UVM, then each runtime phase has its own objections, which control when it comes to an end. I say the runtime phase ends when the number of objections is zero. Strictly speaking, that's checked at the end of the delta cycle. So it's if the number of objections raised is zero at the end of a delta cycle, in other words, roughly speaking, at the end of the time step. So what all of that means is that if you run a UVM simulation and you don't raise any objections, simulation will end at time zero. And that's a very common beginner's mistake in UVM. If you don't have any objections raised, the current phase will end. And if the current phase happens to be your only runtime phase, that means simulation is over. So do make sure that you raise at least one objection within the first delta cycle of each phase. Otherwise, the phase will just end straight away. Let's see what the code looks like. And it really is quite straightforward. So objections are associated with phases, and you can raise and drop objections by calling the raise objection and the drop objection method of the phase. The one thing to remember is that in order to raise and drop objections, you have to have a reference to the phase object that represents the phase that's currently executing, the run phase in this case. So here in this run phase method of our top level environment, we're running a, a default virtual sequence. So we're creating an instance of the sequence, randomizing the sequence object, and then raising an objection before we start the sequence. The sequence will then run through to completion. And when the sequence is finished, we can drop that objection again so that our phase can end. So raise objection has one compulsory argument, one first argument, and that's always a reference to the component or sequence that's raising or dropping the objection. And then there's a second optional argument, which is a text string, which is very useful for diagnostic purposes. 
So remember the command line flag that we saw a few slides back for tracing objections. When you trace objections, then the string that you pass into the raise objection and drop objection methods gets printed out as part of the objection trace, and that's a great help in debugging objection code. So we can certainly raise and drop, drop objections from components in this way. And a way that's very often recommended for dealing with objections, at least in simple cases, is to raise an objection before you start a sequence and drop, drop that same objection when the sequence is over. And that always guarantees that the sequence itself will run through to completion before the phase ends. Of course, that doesn't absolutely guarantee that all of the activity associated with that sequence will have come to an end. The sequence that we're starting here might have injected some stimulus into the design under test, but that stimulus could still be in flight when we get to drop this objection. So there's a little more to raising and dropping objections than simply to write objections around all of your st stimulus. So another place that we might raise and drop objections is on a per cycle basis within a driver or a monitor or a scoreboard component. So in this case, we've got a driver component that grabs the next transaction from the sequence. The driver having got the trans transaction, it raises an objection to say that the driver is busy. It then goes through the protocol communicating with the design under test that might take a number of clock cycles. And then when the driver has finished driving the transaction into the design under test, it drops the objection again. And that might be sufficient to keep the phase going until the stimulus is ready to apply the next transaction and maybe raise another objection at some higher level. So this kind of approach of raising and dropping objections is definitely the right way to think about objections. This is the way objections are intended to be used. So any UVM component or sequence that's doing something can raise an objection in order to extend the test for that little bit more simulation time. The issue is that determining when the test is over is inherently a distributed process. So the sequence, drivers, monitors, scoreboards could all have a hand in determining exactly when a particular test comes to an end. So a driver might inject some stimulus. Sometime later, a transaction might come out the other side of the design under test and be propagated to a scoreboard that then has to do some checking. And we don't want our test to end until the scoreboard has finished its checking. So in principle, the right way to deal with this issue is to use objections in order to distribute the solution to the problem of when the simulation is really finished. So having a driver raise an objection when it's about to do something is the right way to think about objections. Some experts, however, would want to raise the issue at this point that you do have to be quite careful about performance because raising and dropping objections on a per cycle basis can have an impact on simulation speed. So do think a little bit about simulation speed when you're raising and dropping objections at this sort of low level. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing to do. So if we pull apart this code a little bit more, what's happening here is that the driver is receiving a transaction, raising an objection, and then talking to the design under test by wiggling some pins. Now, whether we're going to get any noticeable simulation speed impact from raising or dropping this objection all depends how much work the design under test does when it receives this transaction. If the design under test does a lot of work when it receives this transaction, the speed impact of raising and dropping this objection might be invisible. On the other hand, if the design under test does almost no work, then raising and dropping the objection could have a significant impact, and you might then want to think about rewriting your code to adjust how often you raise objections or where you raise objections within the verification environment. So this is the right way to think about objections, but do just take care that you don't raise and drop objections too frequently, such that they have an impact on simulation speed. So we've seen a couple of examples of raising and dropping objections from UVM components. Now let's think about sequences. And the big issue with raising and dropping objections in sequences is that we won't necessarily have access to the phase in which the sequence is running. 
In a component, you're always going to be raising and dropping objections from a phase method, so you will have access to the phase argument. That's not true inside a sequence. So suppose we want to raise an objection actually within the body task of a sequence. Well, UVM provides for you a method get starting phase so that you can determine the phase in which the sequence is running. However, that phase won't necessarily be set because although UVM provides this get starting phase method, it doesn't automatically set the starting phase of the sequence. The starting phase, it turns out, has to be set manually. So what we're doing here inside the body method is getting the starting phase of the sequence and then checking that the phase has been set before we attempt to raise and drop objections. If the phase has been set, then we'll raise an objection at the start of the body method and drop that objection again at the end of the body method. So now let's take a look at how you set the starting phase. And you do that by calling the set starting phase method of the sequence object. So UVM provides a set starting phase method in the UVM sequence base class. And the process that starts the sequence can optionally call the set starting phase method. If that process doesn't call the set starting phase method and it's not obliged to, then of course that sequence won't be able to raise or drop any objections associated with that particular phase. A few final nuances on objections. There's a little more to objections that I've been describing. One feature of objections is that by default, when you raise an objection in a component, that objection gets propagated up through the UVM component hierarchy, component by component, until it reaches the very top level component in the UVM component hierarchy, UVM top. The propagation of objections up through the UVM component hierarchy doesn't really have any benefits aside from the fact that there are some methods that you can call to determine the precise number of objections that have been raised for any particular component. But aside from diagnostic purposes, having objections propagated up the hierarchy merely slows down simulation. It doesn't actually functionally change when the simulation will end. We reckon it's a really good idea in the latest version of UVM, in UVM 1.2, to switch off objection propagation by calling set propagate mode 0 for each objection. That is a method call that you have to call explicitly for each objection in order to turn off the automatically occurring objection propagation. Then sometimes it can be convenient to simply allow your verification environment a little bit of extra time for processing after the final objection has been dropped in any given phase. And you can do that by setting a drain time for the objection. So the drain time simply allows a little bit of extra time between the number of objections reaching zero and the particular phase coming to an end. And hopefully you've allocated enough time so that all of the transactions can drain out of the design under test into the scoreboard and be checked. There's another feature closely related to the drain time, and that's the timeout of the UVM simulation. Timeout isn't associated with particular objections, but one of the main reasons for the timeout is to help debug objections. Suppose you have a bug in your objection code such that a particular objection is never dropped. Well, if the objection is never dropped, the UVM phase that's currently running will just keep on running. And so what the timeout allows us to do is to set a timeout or a backstop on simulation. So in the case of that specific bug occurring, the UVM simulation would stop when the timeout is reached. So you can play with all the features I've been talking about right now by taking advantage of the easier UVM code generator running on EDA Playground. If you go to the URL shown at the top of the slide here, you can run this example for yourselves. So here we have an example where in the run phase method, we're setting propagate mode to zero so our objection doesn't propagate. We're also setting a drain time for the objection. We're then creating and randomizing a virtual sequence object. 
raising an objection, and then starting that sequence without setting the starting phase. So we're ignoring any objections that the sequence might attempt to raise, and instead we're just raising a single objection around the top level virtual sequence, running that virtual sequence to completion, and then dropping that objection again. At the bottom of the window, you can see many of those things happening in the simulation log. So do feel free to try this example for yourselves on EDA Playground. So that brings us to the end of this particular tutorial. At Dulos, we're a training company. We run training classes worldwide in any of the subjects that you can see here on this slide, and in particular, of course, System Verilog and UVM. So if you want to know any more about training from Dulos, do visit our website, dulos.com.